This morning we're here for the Peck Lecture, and the Peck Lecture is named in honor of Dr. Ralph Peck, a distinguished member of ASCE. This lecture is delivered annually by a geotechnical engineer selected for outstanding contributions to the profession through the analysis uh, and publication of case histories. Uh, this lecture has been delivered since uh, 1999. That makes this the 17th Ralph Peck Lecture. Um, our 215, 2015 Peck Award winner is Dr. Donald H. Gray. Professor Gray has made major and longstanding contributions in the broader field of geoenvironmental engineering, soil behavior, and soil re reinforcement. However, the field for which he is recognized as an authority worldwide is the field of bioengineering, biostabilization, and geomorphic modification, which is also known as land farming. Throughout his career, Professor Gray has made unique contributions as a researcher, educator, and, const and consultant in promoting engineering techniques for stabilization of earth masses that are not just environmentally friendly, but are fully integrated with the environment they are engineered in. With the increasing recognition of the importance of sustainability, these techniques are not only becoming accepted, but are often preferred compared to the more traditional hard engineering approaches. Professor Gray has arguably made the most contributions in the fields through the development of design methodologies based on analytical evaluations of, for the successful implementation of these techniques in engineering practices. This allows their performance in the field to be assessed and the development of recommendations, practice, recommended practices based on the performance of these projects to be developed. Surely, this approach uh, of, anal of an analytical insight compared with keen observation of field performance, in addition to learning and an improvement of engineering practice, is in complete harmony with Professor Peck's own philosophy. As a developer and proponent of the observational method, Ralph Peck demonstrated by example the essential role of learning from case histories to minimize risk and assure success in geotechnical engineering and construction of complex process, projects. Don Gray, in his published papers and books, has drawn on many lessons and illustrations from case histories that serve to both help define and validate the fundamentals of bioengineering of the ground around us and the sites on which we work. I'd like to ask Dr. Gray to come up to the stage. I'm proud to present you with the Ralph Peck Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Dr. Gray, thank you for your contributions to our profession, and we look forward to your lecture. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to be selected for the Peck Award and to present uh, the Peck Lecture titled Bio Biostabilization of Slopes and Stream Banks. I am very pleased to discuss the evolution of this technology and to describe several case histories. A few remarks are in order about Ralph Peck, whom this lecture is named after. And I'm indebted to Dave Rogers for this slide. Dave spent a week-long interview with Ralph Peck and published his findings. Uh, Peck, as you have heard, was a keen proponent of case histories. He expressed this view forcefully in a commentary titled The Value of Hindsight that was published in Geostrata in 2006. And I quote uh, from Ralph Peck's commentary, few geotechnical problems have not already been encountered in the past. It is case histories that provide the means for avoiding them in the future. Peck was also willing to discuss successes and mistakes, believing that we could learn from both. And I plan to follow this tradition in, in my own presentation. Uh, biostabilization, uh, we could say, is a somewhat unconventional topic that straddles both engineering and biology or botany. But it accords with Peck's belief that we should be 
well-rounded civil engineers and open to new ideas and concepts. You can think of my lecture today as a play in two parts, beginning with a prelude in which I will mention some accomplishments. And then the first part will be essentially an introduction, definitions of biostabilization, the principal attributes and features. The evolution of biostabilization, some key technical publications, and international biostabilization conferences, of which there have been three, uh, and then some biostabilization highlights, just a brief uh, description of some common techniques and applications. We can't discuss them all, obviously, this morning. At that point, uh, there will be a brief pause or intermission, however, please don't leave your seats, uh, during which I will regroup and try to make a few comments about and observations about stabilization of slopes in general before we move on to the second part of the lecture in which I will present some selected case studies, only two. One is a stream bank uh, stabilization project and the other a cut slope, highway cut slope project. And finally, uh, a brief mention of some recent advances and developments in the field. I would like to acknowledge uh, colleagues, at least in the United States, who have contributed in important ways to the field of biostabilization, starting with uh, John McCullough and Robin Sotier, who are early pioneers, uh, skilled practitioners, and co-authors uh, with whom I've collaborated with on various projects. Andrew Leiser is a professor of environmental horticulture at UC Davis, who teamed up with me way back in 1982 to write the first US book on biostabilization. T.H. Uh, Wu is a professor of civil engineering at Ohio State University. And he has recognized the value of woody vegetation for stabilizing slopes, and he has rigorously anal analyzed the contribution of vegetation to slope stability. He and his colleagues at Ohio State recently published a paper on a biostabilization technique that was uh, in the fall issue of uh, geotechnical engineering, geotechnical and environmental engineering. Uh, Charles Crable is a silviculturalist, or was a silviculturist, he's now deceased, with the USDA Forest Service. Um, he wrote a detailed case study uh, on the use of live fascines to stabilize a steep road fill in the Angeles Forest in Southern California. So this technique goes way back into the, into the early 30s. And this publication sparked my interest in this field. Doug Shields is a hydraulic engineer, formerly with the US Corps of Engineers, now in private practice. And he has actively pursued field research in uh, biostabilization, and we've collaborated on a number of projects. It's worth pausing to review some of the salient literature on biostabilization. I plunged into this field uh, back in the 1980s when I teamed up with Andrew Leiser, I mentioned previously, to write a book titled Biotechnical Slope Protection and Erosion Control. Ten years later, a book was published in England describing the use of vegetation and civil engineering in general, and not only in biotechnical or in geotechnical engineering. I co-authored another book with, uh, on biostabilization in 1996 with Robin Sotier, who I mentioned was a consultant and early pioneer in the field. This book was subsequently translated into Japanese and Chinese and published in both countries. Many other public publications devoted to biostabilization soon followed, as shown in the next slide. In the mid-1990s, a number of books were published. These included guidelines and how to do it manuals, 
published by both state and federal resource agencies. An international conference, Vegetation and Slopes, was held in London, England in 1995 that focused on the benefits of vegetation for both erosion control and slope stabilization. Two Austrians, uh, Schichtel and Stern, published companion volumes, one devoted to, to uh, ground techniques in 1996 and a follow-on publication to water techniques in 1997. Hugo Schichtel is considered by many as the father of biostabilization. The first introduction to biostabilization at a geotech conference in the United States was at the ASC Specialty Conference on the Stability of Slopes and Embankments that was held in, in, 19, uh, in Berkeley, California in 1992, some 23 years ago. At that time, I presented a poster session uh, titled Biotechnical Slope Stabilization. There have been three, no less than three, international conferences on biostabilization to date, starting with the first in Paris, France, 2004, then every four years later, the second in Beijing, China, 2008, and the third in Vancouver, Canada. Perhaps the time has come to host such a conference here in the United States, and perhaps the Geo Institute would like to take a lead role in this effort. Uh, the conference themes have differed slightly, but the subtitles remain the same, namely the use of vegetation to improve slope stability. Uh, slope stabilization runs the gamut from inert construction, so traditional stabilization, usually using only inert materials at one extreme to live construction or vegetative stabilization using only plants between, using only plants. And in between we have mixed construction or biostabilization using both plants and or cuttings plus inert structural components. Well, what distinguishes biostabilization from traditional geotechnical stabilization measures? Here are some examples of the latter. Uh, the point here is that the materials used in these traditional measures or examples are inert, that is, non-living. An example of a conventional inert retaining stru structure, a step-back gabion retaining wall. The gabions are simply rock-filled wire baskets. Another example of a conventional inert retaining structure a concrete counterfort retaining wall. I took this photo uh, of this wall along a freeway in San Francisco. The frontal openings in this case simply serve as sort of quasi planter boxes. So it's primarily, primarily decorative, uh, the plantings, but they could be construed as having a air cleansing role along the highway. At the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, vegetative stabilization. The materials used here are basically different types of vegetation uh, that are used alone. This might include grasses, forbs, and shrubs. An example, a vegetative cover here is used to stabilize a highway cut slope against surficial erosion. It's really quite attractive and effective for this purpose. Dune grass has the ability to send out shoots at higher and higher elevations, thereby trapping, drifting, and accreting sand. And it's very effective at stabilizing sand dunes. Uh, so dune vegetation has the ability to survive burial uh, and to send out roots at higher and higher elevations as the sand accretes. Uh, this can result in widespread permeation and distribution of uh, fibrous roots, as shown in this photo. In fact, a patented French reinforced earth system using randomly distributed artificial fibers, known as Texol, really kind of mimics this effect. Vetiver grass has a very dense, deeply penetrating, and tough 
root system, the roots support an equally dense, strong, and erect stem and leaf structure. Vetiver is widely used in tropical and subtropical regions, mainly for erosion control. The grass is normally planted in hedge-like uh, arrays on contour across slopes. Now we come to mixed construction or biostabilization. Biostabilization is an animal known by different names. Uh, soil bioengineering or simply bioengineering is a common name. Biotechnical slope protection. The definition of bioengineering is simply the arrangement in the ground of live vegetation, mainly cuttings, in various arrays to provide soil reinforcement, moisture control or drainage, and barriers to erosion and shallow earth movement. According to this definition, hedge arrays of vetiver grass could be classified as a type of soil bioengineering treatment. However, the focus of this lecture will be on other techniques and measures. Biotechnical slope protection is uh, defined as the integrated or combined use of living vegetation and inert structural components to stabilize slopes. Are there potential problems mixing plants and inert structures uh, together? In some cases, such as these shown in these two photographs, uh, vegetation, roots and stems can have adverse and disruptive effects. However, these adverse effects tend to be somewhat overblown. I call your attention to the bottom photo on the right. The use of camphor trees, for example, is a poor choice for street plantings because camphor trees have elephantine root systems which tend to uh, heave up pavements. In other cases, uh, the interaction between live vegetation and inert structures is, is either benign, uh, quasi-decorative, or, or simply amusing, as shown by these three photos, two photos. Now, some examples of beneficial plant structure interactions. The Cornish hedgerow, which is found in southwestern England, is a classic example of how woody plant material can coexist and actually help stabilize or reinforce inert structures. The roots actually avoid mechanical obstacles in sunlight in these walls. Uh, here's a hedgerow wall supporting massive oak trees atop the wall with no adverse influence on the integrity of the wall system. A close examination of this hedgerow showed that the roots of the oak tree simply flowed around and engulfed the rocks in the wall without displacing them one little bit. Uh, these types of hedgerow walls are also found in Normandy, France. They were formidable barriers to Allied troops during World War II, who had great difficulty penetrating or breaching hedgerow walls, even with heavy armored tanks. Live woody tissue has this amazing ability to flow around and engulf mechanical obstacles without displacement nor distortion. None of the metal wires nor poles in this chain link fence were dislodged nor moved out of place. Now, some biostabilization highlights a few selected techniques which I will discuss. Starting with uh, harvesting, you have to get the plant material somehow or other. Uh, live staking, very common widely used technique. Joint planting, sometimes called vegetated riprap, in which the stakes are inserted into rock armor. Uh, live fascines, another widely used technique. Fascines with RECPs, RECPs are rolled erosion control product. Live brush layering, slimmer, similar to live fascines, but the orientation of the plant material is quite different. And brush layers with geogrid wraps, uh, also known as vegetated, mechanically stabilized earth, or colloquially as burrito wraps. When it comes to harvesting, 
different types of shrub species that propagate readily from cuttings, particularly willows, are the best source of vegetation for biostabilization. Other species such as alder and dogwood also work well. So these live cuttings can be obtained by using loppers, as shown on the right, or chainsaws. And very importantly, the material should be cut during dormancy. That means after leaf, leaf drop in the fall. Live staking is perhaps the most common and widely used uh, technique. It can be employed also with other uh, measures such as uh, erosion control blankets and netting. Here are the specifications for live staking or joint planting. We're basically talking about uh, stakes about two to three feet in length, an inch or so in diameter. There are other requirements for successful installation. Perhaps burying the stake at least 80% of its length in the ground is, is, is the most important installation requirement. Live stakes should be tamped, not driven, into the ground using what's called a dead blow lead-filled rubber mallet to avoid mashing the top of the stake. As I mentioned, live stakes can be employed together with other erosion control techniques such as netting and erosion control blankets. If the instructions are followed, the live stake should leaf out at the top and root along the length of their embedded length. Here's a project in which a shallow slump in a step road cut <coughs> was repaired by live staking, or in this case, simply pinning the failure mass. Photos taken of the live stake failure mass uh, after three months up at the top and a year later. This project was a test of life staking to stabilize the banks of a county drain in Michigan. Now, unskilled prison labor was used on this project. The prisoners were given rudimentary instructions, provided with tools axes, saws, and sledgehammers, just the sort of equipment you want to give to prisoners, <laughs> and overseen by a uniform guard, presumably to prevent their escape. Uh, no safety gear or clothing was provided other than a red vest, which I think would help to spot any escaping prisoners. Well, the project was a good test of what I would call the error tolerance of this particular technique. <clears throat> Note that the sledgehammer was used to drive the live stakes. Uh, and additionally, the live stakes were not inserted to their correct depth. Even so, vegetation was excellent in spite of these installation mistakes. The main problem now is excessive channel roughness and lack of conveyance that occur in a hydraulically narrow channel. When I try to take a picture of these people at work, the guard said, you can't do that. That's a violation of their constitutional rights to privacy, to which one of the prisoners said, that's OK. My picture is already up in the post office. <laughs> Live stakes can also be inserted between rock armor or riprap to increase both lift-off resistance and to improve habitat value. Here's an example of live stakes being inserted, unfortunately driven, uh, through riprap, even though he's using a dead below rubber mallet. Uh, this insertion method is problematic because the stakes tend to get skinned on the way when they're driven through the rock, and very often they're not driven to, uh, to an adequate depth. So an alternative or preferable method of vegetating rock armor is what's called a bent pole method. Uh, these branches are first laid on the bank, uh, partially covered with rock starting at the bottom, and the branch tips are then bent upwards, pulled upwards, and finally more rock is placed, thus locking the tips in place, as shown in this schematic diagram. Here's a photograph, for example, of a live stake growing in rock armor that is well established. This stake was not driven. It was instead the bent willow pole method was employed. The next most common method 
uh, and our widely employed biostabilization technique is the use of live machines. These are just simply elongated bundles of willow cuttings or other suitable vegetation that are placed in shallow trenches, normally on contour, and then secured in place with either live stakes or inert construction stakes. The willow bundles are then partially covered with soil that is worked into the bundles. A photograph of these fascine bundles, typically about six to eight inches in diameter. And as I mentioned, the bundles are tied together every so often, every 10 or 12 inches with twine. Uh, construction of the bundles is most easily done on saw bucks to raise them off the ground. Interesting photo here. This is an exhumed fascine after one year showing adventitious vertical sinker roots emanating from the willow bundles. One of the ear earliest examples, uh, this was work done in 1936, way back, uh, describing the use of machines to arrest erosion on steep mountain roads in Southern California. The, uh, this embankment was protected by rows of machines. This is on the Angeles Crest Highway in Southern California. Uh, the work starts at the bottom of the slope and works upslope. In this particular case, the plant material was lowered to the workers by means of a crane system on the roadway. Soil losses were 50 times less than those on the control plots and also considerably less, four times less, than areas treated only with conventional erosion control plantings. Now, live machines can be used are employed with rolled erosion control products like netting or er erosion control blankets to improve performance. The erosion control product is run into the fascine trenches as shown in this schematic before placing the fascine. So the fascine bundles are placed on top of the, of the netting and then staked in place. The, uh, the blanket helps to control erosion between the fascine rays. Fashine rows. So here's an example of a coconut fiber uh, blanket or netting that's being used in conjunction with live fascines. And here's the live fascine staked in place over the erosion control blanket in the trench. Live rush layering is also a widely used biostabilization technique. Uh, branches are inserted into the slope as opposed to running parallel to the slope surface. As such, it mimics conventional methods of mechanically stabilized earth using geosynthetics or geogrids. This orientation is also more effective for controlling shallow mass wasting as opposed to machines, which are more suitable for controlling surficial erosion. This is two photos showing uh, the placement and orientation of the live branches in a typical brush layer installation. Uh, note how the tips of the branches protrude slightly beyond the surface of the slope. Some of the stabilizing effects of brush layer inclusions on steepened slopes. Well, you get primary enforcement from the embedded stems, secondary reinforcement from adventitious rooting along the length of the buried stem. Surficial erosion control from the tips of the brush, foliage tips. Moisture depletion by evapotranspiration. This is just a wicking action from the live vegetation. Favorable modification of the groundwater flow by the brush layers would act as quasi-horizontal drains. So there's some advantages here that you do not get by using inert uh, geogrids or geotextiles. Here's a concrete crib wall used to stabilize the top part of the slope and a brush layer on the lower portion. This photo was taken in Oakland, California. A road embankment in North and Carolina stabilized by brush layers. You notice in the photo at the left hand side up at the top, uh, sloughing and erosion were starting to encroach on the guardrail at the top of the slope. So the top photo shows the brush layers installed being during construction and then 
the slope one year after construction. Brush layering can also be combined with conventional mechanically stabilized earth, uh, the latter using geotextiles or geogrids. And this technique is referred to as vegetated mechanically stabilized earth, or colloquially as burrito wraps. The live branches or cuttings are simply inserted between successive wrapped lifts of soil. The geosynthetic layers provide additional and immediate reinforcement, and the live brush layers provide the advantages that were alluded to in the previous slide. Some examples of brush layering used in combination with conventional mechanically stabilized earth using geogrids to protect a stream bank. This is on the Pembina River in Canada. Note the proper use of protective clothing by the workers in this case. Another example of brush layering used in combination with geogrid wrap soil lifts. This is in my hometown, in Arbor, Michigan, on the Huron River. In this case, the cuttings were held too long in stag stagnant water and inserted after leaf out. Nevertheless, some of the cuttings, namely alder and dogwood, uh, survived and colonization of the slope with volunteers was pretty good. Uh, the top photo shows the spring of 2008, shortly after construction, and then again last year in the fall of 2014, the colonization of slope by native vegetation is excellent. Guidelines for different types of uh, biostabilization techniques were prepared as part of a NCHRP research project that was published in 2007. John McCullough, who's the principal with Silex Applied Ear Care, was the project director. Both of us were principal investigators. Major categories are, are shown on this slide. River training measures, uh, bank armor and protection, and slope stabilization. Some 50 different techniques are described in this uh, publication. Okay, I'd like to pause now briefly and, and turn to the second part of my presentation. Okay, while we're waiting for these slides to, to appear, um, I'd like to just make a few comments about some of the vagaries and uncertainties that are associated with stabilization in general and biostabilization. Uh, biostabilization applications are appropriate remedy for surficial erosion and shallow seeded slope failures. They're, they're not really appropriate for deep seeded slides. Uh, they're appropriate where environmental considerations are important, for example, visual appearance. Where site access is difficult or disturbance must be minimized. They're inappropriate where you have toxic soils or extremely droughty soil conditions. Uh, one wants to avoid having a permanent irrigation system, except perhaps initially to get the vegetation established. There are some constraints on biostabilization, uh, harvesting and installation of plant materials should be done during dormancy. That's after leaf out in the fall and before after leaf drop in the fall and before leaf out in the spring. So you can't really do it during the summertime, but that's when the construction season occurs. There is a way around it. You can simply harvest in the fall and hold the cuttings or plants in cold storage. Um, and then install them during the summer. The only problem with that is it drives up your costs if you have to put your plant material in in uh, cold storage. Well, I've cited conditions that are not appropriate for biostabilization. Are there some types of slope failures that are questionable for any type of stabilization, either conventional or biotechnical? I submit that relocation and avoidance should be considered where there is, one, a history of large, deep-seated landslides in the area, and where does potential loss of many lives should a landslide occur? 
I'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, the La Conchita landslide in California and the Oso landslide in Washington fall into this category. A colleague, Dave Elton, and I discussed this issue in a paper that we've prepared for possible publication in Geostrata. Let me now turn to the second part of uh, my presentation. This is the La Conchita landslide, which occurred in uh, California. There were actually two slides, one in 95 and the second slide that occurred 10 years later. Uh, Deep-seated slope failures are not really amenable to biostabilization, and they can even pose a severe challenge to conventional stabilization techniques. And as I've suggested, in some cases, avoidance and relocation may be the best solution. The La Conchita landslide is a great case in point. Two landslides struck La Conchita. This is a small community in Southern California. The first in 1995. The second in 2005, the second landslide resulted in many deaths. And as you can see, a retaining wall was constructed at the bottom of the slope after the 1995 landslide it was completely ineffectual. It was really not intended to arrest slope failures. It was only put in as a temporary fix to uh, open the road, which you can see in the center of the, of the the problem was it gave residents a false sense of security, seeing this large retaining wall. Here are some examples of what I would call dubious bank holdups. In the upper right-hand corner is a shoreline defense, Lake Michigan. I call that the rubber ducky defense. And then on the left-hand side are some examples of uh, stabilization of banks and gullies using car bodies. In Michigan, we refer to this as Texas riprap. <laughs> On the bottom right photo is a uh, bank protection project, Stream Bank, in Carmel, California, in which uh, concrete rubble was used as a revetment. Well, the concrete rubble is OK. The problem is they left all the rebar poking out of it. And uh, this stream is a favorite one for, for rubber rafters, little kids and rafts going down, they're in danger of poking their eye out in this rebar. Well, now on to some, some case histories where biostabilization was used to good advantage. Uh, the first case study is a stream bank repair and stabilization project on the Russian River in California. The client on this project was, uh, was uh, the Department of Transportation, or Caltrans, the principal consultant on the project and project designer was Salix Supplied Earth Care in Reading. Details, details about this project uh, were actually contained in a paper by McCullough and Gray that was presented at Geo Congress in 2012. So I'm only going to touch on the highlights of this project today. During high water, the river was eroding the bank and threatening to cut off the approach to Highway 138 Bridge, which is an important crossing. Uh, and you can see that the bank line has been turned into a J-hook, which shoots the water across to the other side. So this is not a very good, good condition to have. Uh, peak, jar peak discharges along this section of river are on the order of tens of thousands of cubic feet per second. In fact, the river rose over 15 feet in one day during a major rainstorm that hit Northern California during the week of December 14, 2014. The, the Russian River is a Salmonid stream, so the Fish and Wildlife Agencies argued strenuously against the use of more rock armor at this site. So the following access and biostabilization measures were selected and implemented an access ramp and pad. The use of rock veins. Rock veins is a redirective technique that's frequently employed with biostabilization measures. Uh, live siltation, which I will describe shortly. A low the construction of a low flood terrace, which was planted with willow poles. Uh, so the willow poles were placed on the, on the low flood terrace. Well, here's some pictures of the access ramp and rock pad. 
Uh, the rock pad formed the leading edge of a low flood terrace, which served as a critical, critical component or substrate for several of the biostabilization measures. The decision was made not to grade the bank back and armor the riverbank. Instead, a series of rock veins were constructed that directed the center of gravity of flow, the so-called Thalweg, uh, away from the bank. This greatly reduced the, the tractive stresses and scour erosion acting on the bank, even during high water when these veins were completely submerged. A biostabilization technique known as live siltation was constructed along the leading edge of the rock pad. The willow cuttings added uh, additional roughness and promoted sedimentation. Keep in mind that roughness on this bank here is okay because it's a hydraulically wide stream and so it did not affect conveyance. A longitudinal stone toe protection it was just uh, simply an elongated stone mound which served, one, to protect the rock pad and two, to provide a backstop against which to lean a row of live willow cuttings. This is the live siltation method. So the cuttings were placed so that they leaned toward the water and the space behind, the space in the trench behind the edge of the rock pad and the longitudinal stone toe was backfilled with rocks and coarse aggregate. Low, flow, low flood terrace was formed by filling in the space between the rock pad and the bottom of the bank with soil and coarse aggregate. Live willow poles uh, and posts were inserted, inserted into holes that were augured in, this, in the flood terrace, and these provided additional roughness and encouraged sedimentation. A mixture of both willow and cottonwoods were used for these poles and posts, Cottonwood turned out not to be a particularly suitable plant material because it's more brittle than, than uh, willow and, and tends to break under stress. Well, here's an overview of all the measures after construction. So most of the major stabilization measures are visible in this photo, namely the rock pad, the rock veins, live siltation, the low flood terrace, and the willow pole plantings. Performance evaluation consisted of the following, visual observation, turbidity monitoring, uh, the thalweg displacement, vegetation establishment, and the storm flood response. Caltrans uh, inserted a webcam on the bridge that enabled visual monitoring of the site 24 hours a day. Uh, the flow regime displacement, or thalweg, was determined by by recording the velocity of objects that were thrown into the stream uh, at different distances from the bank. Not a very technologically sophisticated method, but nevertheless uh, effective. Uh, turbidity measurements were made by sampling the river at different times and locations during construction. Exceedance of specified limits required suspension of work. These limits were never exceeded because possible turbidity problems were avoided by using washed rock in the, in the pad and, and the veins. The position of the thalweg, or the center of gravity flow, is critical during high water. These are three pictures showing the, the river during low water, medium water, and, and high water at almost bank full flow. Uh, measurements show that the higher velocity currents were displaced away from the bank by the rock veins and other biostabilization measures. Uh, even during high water inundation of the rock veins when there were as much as six or nine feet of water over the top of the veins. And flow was virtually quiescent near the bank. The site has undergone several high water events, including a recent overbank flow of 40,000 cubic feet per second in December of 2014, which I mentioned previously. The winter of 2010-11 flood occurred before the vegetation was well established. 
Even so, vegetation establishment has been vigorous and robust. Uh, the increased roughness from the willows planted on the low flood terrace and live siltation next to the rock pad promoted sedimentation as opposed to the scour and erosion that had occurred there previously. So these are views, winter views, uh, in February of 2013 and two years later. Summer views, one year later and four years later, uh, establishment and condition of the protective bank vegetation has been durable and effective. This is a photo I took myself from the bridge of the site in September of last year when I was on a bicycle tour in Northern California. So things were looking pretty good then. Uh, conclusions from this uh, case history. Well, the rock veins have redir redirected high flows. Uh, the veins are effective in uh, high energy rivers, such as the Russian River. Life sentation and the willow poles have helped to slow stream velocities and promote sedimentation. And lastly, these biostabilization techniques were quite buildable and cost effective. Here's a review and update of this project, which appeared just this month in Land and Water magazine. It confirms the generally good results and findings noted previously, suggests some possible modifications that could have been implemented at the outset to improve performance still further, uh, namely the use of wider rock veins, the installation of a bendway, bendway weir system upstream of the site to move the thawweg yet further away from the bank. And lastly, the use of willow poles only and uh, on the low flood terrace and not the use of cottonwoods, which tended to be brittle and break. The second case study is a highway cut slope stabilization. This project took place in Coleraine, Massachusetts and was completed in 1989. The client was the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. The prime consultant and project designer was Robin B. Sotir and Associates in Marietta, Georgia. Details about this project were presented in a paper by Gray and Sotir that was published in the Journal of Geotechnical Engineering in 1992. So in this particular project, slope failures were triggered by widening of the road. This is supposed to be a scenic highway. And uh, the, the road was widened, and it encroached into the slope. Uh, the cut that was used was fairly steep, one and a half to one. Bedrock was exposed in parts of the cut. Other parts were composed entirely of residual soil. And the latter is where a major slump occurred, as you can see in the right-hand middle part of the picture. There was only, res only residual soil exposed there, no bedrock. And this is where a major slump occurred. The residual soil layer, a variable thickness, uh, overlay of phyllite bedrock. Uh, groundwater flowed from the base of the soil layer and also from fissures in the, in the bedrock. Soil borings were made along in the residual soil along the top of the cut. Grain size distribution was determined in soil samples. The soil was a silty sand with minor amounts of clay-sized material. The average friction angle and cohesion based on samples compacted to their in-situ density was about 36 degrees and 3.5 psi, respectively. The stabilization alternatives with, that were considered here were a uniform rock blanket, which was favored by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation a rock tow buttress, a biostabilization alternative, namely a uniform earthen brush layer fill, and a hybrid system consisting of a rock tow buttress with a brush layer fill atop.
Stability analyses were performed on each of these alternatives. The uniform rock blanket would meet safety factor criteria, 1.5, provided it was thick enough. Uh, this alternative was the choice of the MassDOT highway engineers. It was ruled out, however, because of its stark visual appearance and the fact that this was supposed to be a scenic highway. Now, a rock tow buttress would, would uh, meet mass stability uh, requirements, safety factor requirements, provided it was eight feet thick and at least 30 feet high. You really don't need all that rock up at the top of the slope. It doesn't help mass stability. Uh, the problem with a rock tow buttress, though, is it leaves the top of the slope exposed and subject to seepage erosion. Uh, we conducted stability analyses and showed that uh, a rock tow buttress that was eight feet thick and at least 30 feet high would do the job. Uh, the slope height was 60 feet. Here is the uh, hybrid solution. It was a rock tow buttress with a brush layer reinforced earthen fill atop. So that this met both mass stability and surficial erosion concerns. And in addition, it was visually attractive, as I will show you, and environmentally compatible. So the adopted treatments were a rock toe and a brush layer buttress fill, a hybrid treatment, live machines along the crest, and live staking and netting elsewhere. Construction occurred during the winter, during the dormancy season. This photo was taken in the early spring before leaf out. The brush layers consisted of both willow and alder. Live material was harvested from the margins of both uh, a nearby reservoir, the Quabbin Reservoir near Boston, and an airport. The airport was very happy to get rid of all their willow trees. Uh, this is the appearance of the slope and brush layer uh, buttress fill during the summer of the first year. Vegetation establishment was very good, except for alder, which was used in the lower layers. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the rock toe at the base and of the slope and the brush layer buttress fill at top. Uh, photos were taken at different seasons of the first year. The second year, you can begin to see natural succession and colonization by surrounding uh, in invading native vegetation. After the third year, colonization by native shrubs was pronounced. Uh, some of the vegetation was even becoming established on the surface of the rock toe. In fact, you could hear water running in the rock toe indicating that good drainage was occurring. Several rows of live machines were installed at the top of the road cut, primarily to prevent surficial erosion. The brush layer fill is visible on the left-hand side of the photo. By the second year, the top of the, of the live cut, or the top of the cut was beginning to assume a natural appearance. The residual soil above the exposed bedrock was treated with live staking and netting. Uh, graded rock was placed in the transition area between the exposed bedrock and the brush layer fill. And here's the appearance of same two years after construction. So, conclusions from this uh, case history. Uh, the willows perform better than alder, and this is always a good idea to check out the compatibility of the cuttings that you plan to use. Uh, conventional geotech stability analyses can be adapted to evaluate biostabilization. And finally, conventional slope stabilization techniques can be combined with biostabilization measures in a, in a sort of hybrid system. Some 35 case studies are presented in this book, which was published exactly a year ago. Uh, describing projects from different regions of the United States. The two projects that I presented this morning are included. These case studies are 
discussed from what I would call a retrospective point of view as opposed to a pres prescriptive one, uh, project costs are provided in this collection of case studies. A current NCHRP project is providing a much more detailed and comprehensive evaluation of case studies and biostabilization measures, but in this case only stream bank protection measures. Now, to some recent biostabilization developments. One of the criticisms of biostabilization is the dependence on operator experience and empiricism and the alleged lack of rigorous analyses, reliable field data, and dependable design guidelines. Here are three recent studies that address these concerns head on. And we start with uh, Bichetti, who quantified the effects of, of uh, brush layers on slope stability. Uh, this paper appeared in Ecological Engineering uh, back in 2010. Next, we have a paper by Wu and his colleagues, The Use of Live Poles for Stabilization of Shallow Slope Failures. And this paper appeared in the Journal of Geotechnical and Geovironmental Engineering in October of 2014. And uh, another project, Ayers and Associates, Evaluation and Assessment of Environmentally Sensitive Stream Bank Protection Modules. Uh, they published a quarterly report uh, this is an ongoing, ongoing project that will continue for another two years. Well, this is uh, discussing Bichetti's work. Um, as I said, brush layer installations in the past have been designed largely on the basis of experience and empirical guidelines. This study modified the so-called infinite slope equation to take into account the presence of embedded brush layers on the factor of safety against the shallow planar slope failures. So additional factors were considered, such as the spacing between the brush layers, the length of the brush layers, the length of the embedded portion, and the pullout resistance of the brush layers. So here we have two variations of the infinite slope equation. The one at the top includes the different brush layer parameters, which I, I mentioned. And uh, if you remove, or if you, you notice in this equation here that the pullout resistance appears in the terms up at the top and at the bottom. If there is no brush layer embedment, that term disappears and you end up with the classic infinite slope equation, equation number two at the bottom, with seepage parallel to the slope. So here we now have the means to evaluate the influence of different parameters, such as spacing of brush layers, vertical spacing, the spacing on the horizontal plane, the inclination of the brush, and so on. And here we see an example of a factor of safety calculation Factor of safety plotted against the depth of soil, uh, in this case for a slope without cuttings, and for a slope with cuttings that are spaced vertically three, six, and 10 meters apart. Uh, Large-scale flume tests are being conducted as part of the ongoing NCHRP project to determine the performance characteristics of different types of biostabilization countermeasures. Uh, the applicability and effectiveness of individual measures when subject to varying stream hydraulic and site conditions are being studied. Some of these conditions include the steepness of the bank, two to one, three to one slopes, and stream discharges of 50, 100, and 150 cubic feet per second. So here are some photos of, of a uh, flume test, the, the vegetation, is grown in the top photo. You can see live stakes and uh, live siltation, which is being tested in the flume. The last uh, project I'd like to talk about is the use of live poles for stabilizing shallow slope failures. And the results of this, uh, results and findings appeared in the Journal of Geotechnical 
do environmental engineering in October of 2014. So extensive field tests and measurements were performed on willow pole planting installation used to stabilize an embankment fill against erosion and shallow sliding along a highway in Ohio. The installation was monitored to determine survival rates, the effect of installation method, time of planting, soil type, moisture availability, and some poles were exhumed to determine the extent of adventitious rooting along the length of the pole. The resistance of embedded willow poles to both vertical and lateral loads were measured. On the, the measured failure loads fell within the ranges calculated from theoretical pile capacity equations. So this finding provides support for the use of this approach for estimating lateral pole resistance for stabilization purposes. With that, I come to the end of my talk. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak about biostabilization measures and to describe some applications. And I hope that I've convinced you that biostabilization is an, an environmentally sensitive approach, uh, visually attractive, and cost-effective method for slope protection and erosion control. Thank you. <laughs>